What makes a great fashion image? That's like a right hook. Uh, anything that stays in your mind for more than five minutes, I guess. Is that what you think about when you're taking a photo? Yeah, I, I actually don't have that. It's so rare that I have had the feeling that I look at a picture and think, oh, that's a good one. But you do know, interestingly enough. Um, but it doesn't happen that often. I find I was working with um, Rag and Bone and my opening meeting with the owner, Marcus, he opened up a magazine and went through each picture and he went, I hate that, I hate that, this is rubbish, I hate that, this is shit, this is rubbish, this is rubbish. And effectively went through sort of like a wad of advertising. And he was like, I don't care what we do, it just has to somehow elevate itself above that. Right? So you're sort of getting into this very banal, systematic way of working where all the images are starting to merge into each other. So I suppose if you ever achieve something above that where it doesn't feel like it fits into that box, then it's always a great feeling of elation. You know? Why does everything look the same at the moment? Do you think it's the pace? Are people less experimental? What is it? Yeah, I suppose it's, it's the mentality. Yeah. We've kind of, everyone sort of started to settle into a very corporate way of thinking. Fashion was a cottage industry in the 80s when I started. So, you know, like Body Map, for example, who were my personal favorites. They were just always going broke and, you know, like if you ever got involved in a fashion show with people, it was very Blue Peter, the whole thing. It was very handmade and everyone was sort of pitching and there was no money and, you know, it was, it, the whole production was in very, very lo-fi. And then in the 90s that changed, you know, it sort of became, it just exploded basically and became much more global. So as each change comes, there's like another layer of, uh, sort of you know, intensified corporate thinking, you know, in, in, right the way from the top all the way to the bottom. And so we have to sort of participate in that, that sort of our structure that we have to work within. So. Do you think it will damage the quality of um, the young image makers that will come up within that system? There's no doubt. But I'm slightly conflicted about that because I think back in the 90s when I first started, people used to complain so much then about how bad it was. And now everyone looks back at the 90s and goes, oh my God, it was so amazing. And of course it wasn't. It was like the same issues, the same problems. So I was talking to an editor recently. She was like, you were so lucky to work in that period. And I was like, yeah, but everyone complained in that period. They thought the 70s and 80s was better. You know, it, like if you look back at the 70s, there was all these stories about how David Bailey would go to Mauritius for 10 days and shoot four pictures and then cut, you know what I mean? And then come back if he could be bothered and blah, blah. So I, my attitude is suck it up. Wait, what were you like when you were young? Were you creative? No, not really. Uh, I mean, no, I, I, as a, what, how old? Like really small. Cause you got your first camera at nine. So I guess before that. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in a Mike Lee movie. I was just, you know, it was very, very, very urban, concrete, not a lot going on, you know, so never was taken to museums or anything like that. From about nine onwards, I was really focused on cigarettes and pinball machines. And then, you know, 11, it was or 12, it was like alcohol or girls and then and then clothes, basically. That's sort of very typical. Not a lot going on, actually, it was quite dull. Um, but the one, but my dad was very excited about photography. And uh, he would, there was one, one of his friends would buy Amateur Photography, that magazine, and then one of them would buy it and then pass it on and then pass it on and pass it on. So by the time it came to our house, it was like really old and fumbled and about six months old. But I do remember reading the pages about telephoto lenses and the effect that you could get, or it explained things in the most sophomoric way. So it'd be like, here's a glass of water. And if you put the light to the left, it will look like this. And if you put the light to the right, it'll look like that. And it basically was just describing light and shadows, right? In the most simplistic way. And I was, I do remember being quite riveted by that. Yeah, I got into a lot of trouble actually when I was a kid. And I remember my mom went to see a clairvoyant when I was about 10. And I didn't know what a clairvoyant was. And she was like, you know, like a fortune teller. And, uh, and she said, what she said about your sister wasn't that interesting, but what she said about you was very interesting, which was that you'll follow this sort of line in your life until you get to about 20, and then you're either going to go that way and you'll have a very successful life, or you're going to go that way and you're going to get into a sort of 
darker ways, right? And that is almost exactly what happened. I just got into so much trouble up until I was 20 and then I found photography and just went like that, completely the other direction. Tell me that, that point where you thought about taking pictures because you, you got your first camera, as you said, when you were kind of young and you started taking pictures. My dad worked for the newspapers and he gave me, one, he gave me a camera with one roll of film. He was a bit tight-fisted actually, I have to say. So it wasn't like we had buckets full of things, but he gave me one roll of film and said, here, try this and I'll take it into work and get it developed for free. So I took some pictures and I can't, I can't say that it was a sort of epiphany in any way, but I was definitely quite intrigued by it. And then I never did it ever again. I still have the pictures. And this one was about nine. And then when I left home, uh, I started skateboarding with all these kids in Brighton. And it was the first thing I'd ever seen that really felt like it needed recording. Although it was not a conscious decision. I didn't was like, okay, I must go and buy a camera. And I just sort of drifted into it. And then I met these fashion students in Brighton and they kind of liked my pictures and they were like, oh, you know, you can go to take them to a magazine. And they then drew me into taking pictures of them. And that's how the whole thing started. Mm. So it was quite weirdly organic and easy at that point. Explain the assisting trajectory though, because you did assist. Yeah, at 15 I got a job as a hairdresser in London, and I was really bad at it. Were you cutting boys' hair or girls' hair? I would, not even. I was shampooing and sweeping the floors. And I did it for about a year, and then the hairdresser that I was working for had um, sort of aspirations to become a photographer. So he set up a studio, not that different to this, in the basement of the salon and convinced the owner that they would do all these hair pictures and then put them in hair magazines. So I kind of saw the process for the first time, the model, the lights and everything. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. It was quite simple. Mm. And then I tried to get a job, which took a while, just asking around. But then I did eventually get a job with Norman Watson, who at the time was doing a lot of Buffalo stuff with Ray Petrie. Mm. And um, so I got to work with Ray, which was amazing. And, um, and I worked with Norman for about, I think I did about, six months or seven months with him and then I got fired. Tell me about getting fired. I kept on looking through the lens on the set and he told me not to do it, but I couldn't help myself. I wanted to see what he was seeing. I couldn't figure out the correlation between his eye and the camera and the Polaroid. There seemed to be this sort of disconnect. So I kept, whenever he wasn't looking, I would sneak over and have a look through the lens. <laughs> do just, you think you're quite precocious as a person? Probably, yeah. If I knew myself then, I'd be so embarrassed probably because I was so aggressive to sort of to try anything like my first ever job as a photographer I went to see uh, I went to the face magazine with you know a box of pictures and I sat in reception and I, d I didn't have an appointment I just banged on the door you know and then um, and I waited and I waited and there was a very nice girl on reception called Kelly Wurtz it was very sweet and she was like, well, just, just wait and I'll see if I can get you in to see someone. And of course that wasn't going to happen. So then I just kept coming back. And eventually they were like, oh God, he's just not going away, this guy, right? So we're going to have to cut him some slack. So eventually she was like, fine, Phil's going to see you. So Phil Bicker was the art director. So I eventually got to see Phil and he went through my pictures and he went, yeah, all right, I'll give you a job. So I thought he was just saying that to get rid of me. So, and at the time I didn't have a telephone. So I gave him the number of the escape club in Brighton, which is where I used to go every night. And I didn't think I'd ever hear from him again. And then about three weeks later, I went to the escape club and they said, oh, the face magazine called it. You've got to ring them. So I rang them and they said, okay, you're shooting tomorrow. And you're shooting a band called the Stone Roses, who no one had ever heard of. I called a friend of mine and I was like, do you know this band, the Stone Roses? And he said, oh yeah, it's a rock band from Los Angeles. And the guy wears a bandana. They're very famous. So I was thinking Guns N' Roses were coming. <laughs> and, I, and Guns N' Roses, even they're quite interesting to look back on. But at the time in London in the 80s, they were just the cheesiest looking band ever. So I'm like, <laughs> shit, I can't believe my luck that the first ever portrait I'm going to take for the Face magazine is this cheesy rock band. So in my mind, I thought, OK, I'll be like Richard Avedon and I'll do a monumental 8x10 plate of them and it'll somehow cover up the fact that they look bad. <laughs> when in fact, it does the opposite, you know. Um, but I'd never actually seen an 8x10 plate camera. So I called through and said, just deliver me an 8x10 and everything. And I arrived at the studio one hour before the band arrived and was presented with this black box full of pieces, you know, like a Lego kit or something. 
So I almost started crying, you know, like really upset, like, fuck, what am I going to do? So I ran next door and begged this assistant to come and help me to construct it. So he came and he like screwed it all together and pieced <laughs> it and showed me the lens, you know, like, this is how you do it. And then you and then he helped me load all the plates. So I had 15 plates loaded and then the door swung open and rather than Guns N' Roses, the Stone Roses come in who had <laughs> just started and they were so arrogant and so beautiful and like had that amazing energy that they knew they were about to become the biggest band on the planet, which they did. So they stood and we did 10 amazing plates and they just were so confident and then they were like, right, that's it, we're fucking out of here, mate. And they just walked out the door <laughs> and they were gone, you know, and I was like, I had no idea if the film would come out or anything and then it did and the face liked it and then I started working for them and that was that. When did you start realising that you kind of had a career, that you were successful, you were doing well? Quite soon because there were, the music industry created a steady stream of income. Mm. You could do album sleeves all day long. You know, there was so much money in the music industry at that point. So quite soon after working for the face, I mean, I remember them paying me 110 pounds a page and it just felt like a fortune. You know, I just couldn't believe it. That I was actually gonna get paid to do something that exciting. But I didn't shoot any fashion campaigns for a long time. That came a lot later. I felt that the other photographers that started at the same time as me were naturally really good fashion photographers and I never had that sense about myself. I think it took me about 15 years before I figured it out. Do you think you have quite a fixed idea of what beauty is? No, not, not really. It changes all the time. What is it usually? Well, sometimes I'm very old fashioned and it's just a blonde girl with big boobs. It's like really interesting. And then sometimes it's something completely abstract and random and just miles away from anything. People often describe your work as cinematic. That's a word that come, came up a lot when I was researching you. Do you think that your work is cinematic? I mean, I remember being obsessed with television when I was a kid, you know. And if a film came on that I liked, I'd be excited about a week before. So I, I, it, honestly, I was probably more excited about cinema than I was about fashion. Mm. But then the two came together because then I was so excited. I, I can still remember what looking at all the girls on the playground, especially when the skinhead period came in where they had the sort of shaved head with the fringe in the back. I just thought that was the most amazing look for all these girls in the town. You know, That was a particularly good one. Um, and I do remember even as a young kid walking down the street and my mum said, when these boys walk past you, look the other way. So of course I immediately looked, you know, and it was this kid with green teeth and spiky hair and everything, which I just thought was so brilliant, you know. So I'm kind of, I'm a bit of a contradiction in the one sense that I'm very conventional suburban boy and yet part of me wants to see anything that I've never seen before and sort of anything that's testing or pushing or provoking or I'm very excited by that. Mm. I kind of I feel like I use people as props random strangers you know they sort of become the props because one of the things that I find interesting in your work and you might think I'm completely wrong in my reading of this is that I think there's like an interesting tension between it being quite cinematic and quite kind of fictional and very much about a narrative and then this other side where it's very kind of real and very documentary based in some ways yeah I I, I was I mean I definitely liked war photography as a kid I had a time life book um, the, it, it, you can probably still get it. It was like a silver book. that was like a very traditional one that they produced in the 70s or the 80s. And one of them was about photojournalism. And so it ran the gamut of sporting photography, war photography, you know, all that sort of, a lot of Pulitzer Prize winning journalistic photography. And I, I was really obsessed with that. Mm. So I think a lot of those images um, stayed with me. And mm. I think I photographed them a lot. I'm always seeing, so, I find it very difficult to be in a studio every day or whatever it is and trying to create something because mm. you know our bound our, essentially we have a girl in a dress that's it right and sometimes an object with the girl in a dress but our parameter is a girl in a dress or a guy or whatever that's what we're shooting so to to reinvent the wheel every single day, you know, to try and find something that you haven't done before, not not for the audience, but just for yourself, you know, some some sense of stimulation or excitement. Mm. 
I find it a lot more difficult to do that in a studio, whereas when you're out on the street, you can be photographing someone and you've just done this amazing hairstyle and it's all starting to look really great and the light's perfect and then someone will just walk through the frame and I love that, you know, it's like it's totally unexpected. There's like a random nature to it. So I'm definitely drawn to that. Mm. And I try and use it as much as I possibly can. When I was chatting to, to Dave Sims for this series, he said, you know, whoever did it last did it first in some ways and because of the pace of the industry, you can kind of someone can do something that maybe they didn't invent and then they become known for it. Do you feel that sometimes where people are doing you and then getting... Absolutely. My, my Giovanni, my agent, said to me, you've got to own it. Doesn't matter if it's not yours, just own it. You know, so shoot it once and it's not yours. You shoot it 10 times, you suddenly own it. It's yours. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it, it's really true that. Are you competitive with your peers? Do you look at what they're doing? I'm not competitive with them. I'm actually quite apathetic, but I'm quite intimidated by them. I see people doing really good work and I think, fuck, that's really good. I should be doing something that good. Um, but I never actively went out to try and find work in the same vein, if you like. If anything, I should have been. I, I didn't really feel like I deserved it, so I was always shocked that they would give me a job in the first place. Why don't you feel like you deserve it? I didn't think it was very good, so I'd kind of look at the pictures and be like, Ooh, let's hope <laughs> they don't realise they're shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then sometimes they'd be like, these are great, and then I'd be like, she's lying. You know? I'm interested in what drives you, because if you know, it seems like you did come to that realisation where you kind of had confidence in your work, and you said you're not particularly competitive with your peers, so what is it that makes you keep shooting is it just a job or is it is there some kind of need to do it I mean I do love it when you really think about what an extraordinary job it is it's incredible really you know that you have this opportunity to go into a studio and create something you know it's mm. really it's an amazing very very few people are that lucky and you know the role of the fashion photographer like the film director is one of the last dictatorial positions left so you know you really can have the ability to walk in and just do what you want. What are you like when you shoot? Because you're very kind of at ease and personable. When you shoot, are you slightly more aggressive? No, just like this. Same. Lots of tea, lots of jokes. Um, yeah, no, the same. I try and I don't. I tend to not work with people that change that. If someone brings something to the table that throws that out the window, I'll generally move away. You know. So, but I kind of get on with most people. Are you it's, it's easy to get on with, yeah, I am. But it's easy to get on with anyone for 10 hours, I find. And that the once in a while, you'll meet someone that's just so vile that you're just like, okay, that's it, I'm done. I never want to work with that person ever again, but it's rare. Like know. who? Well, you want me to say it live on camera? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Bring me a rope and I'll tie it around my neck right now. <laughs> so do you think printed magazines are on their way out? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Netta Porter as a, as, an, as a concept is probably the future where you can just, you know, d it's all about delivery and speed in everything. Mm. So that, that is a concept where you can not only look at your fashion magazine, but then buy that particular, of course, that you know, has to be the future. And you're not precious about that? You wouldn't mind seeing your imagery used in that context? No, as long as the images are okay. Why not? Do you think, do you still have that belief that you'll take your greatest picture that is still to come? No, not a chance. Why, why do you say that? Because the industry's moving in the wrong way. It doesn't lend itself to that. I'd like to think that. What was the last? The last good picture I took was... I can't remember. I think the last time I got excited about taking pictures again was probably when I went back out onto the street and started filming people on the street again about five years ago or whatever. There was probably a few pictures in there where I was like, okay, this is good again. It's possible I'll look back in 30 years from now and find stuff in what I'm shooting today and think that it was really good. I can't see it though. I hope so.